Uh, Julian presented it this morning and defended it, and uh, so there was a lot of discussion uh, about it uh, uh, <coughs> this morning. I thought I would be uh, uh, this would be a, a, an appropriate title for what I was going to talk about, but this morning it, it actually occurred to me that rather than talking about unfit for the future, I, I shall be talking about fitness of the past, actually, uh, past perfection. <laughs> People were better <laughs> in the early days. Uh, so uh, let me begin with a quotation. This is somebody who uh, tried to sum up his career. He said as follows, I try to persuade each one of you to concern himself less with what he has than with what he is, so as to render himself as excellent and as rational as possible. Now, who said that? Well, actually, it was Socrates, <laughs> according to uh, Plato's uh, apology. Now, this is some sort of evidence that right from the beginning of philosophy, <laughs> enhancement was a main concern. So I, I will be talking a bit about this, what they were trying to enhance in the, in <laughs> the ancient days. Uh, when human beings try to eke out a good life, for good life for themselves, they can employ two contrasting strategies. First, they can aim to control the world around them and make it conform, conform to the, their desires as much as possible. Secondly, they could have the aim to control their desires and make them com conform to the state of the external world, the world, outside world, not changing the outside world. Both are ways of satisfying desires. The second strategy roughly corresponds to what is traditionally known as autarky, autarkia, in, in, or something, how it was pronounced in Greek, meaning the rule of oneself. The first strategy doesn't have a traditional label. Uh, I propose to designate it by a neologism, heterarchy, meaning the rule of something other than oneself. The attitude of autarchy was prevalent in ancient philosophy, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. In fact, it was so prevalent or dominant, so it was considered the philosophical attitude. Uh, in Asia, we find this attitude, for instance, in the central Buddhist doctrine that life is essentially suffering, the course of which is unsatisfied and unsatisfiable desires, and, and consequently this suffering can only be alleviated by ceasing to have desires. Ceasing to have desires would be a way of affecting your own mindset, your own attitudes. Water key, in other words. We also find it in the <coughs> Taoist core notion of Wu Wei, or however it's pronounced, the way of non action or non interference, of having a will that's in harmony with the surrounding world and avoiding interfering with the you know, <coughs> outside world or external world. Uh, I shall, however, be focusing on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. In his Incubidion, or manual or handbook, as, as it's usually uh, translated, the Stoic Epictetus starts out by making uh, a rather startling claim. He says, of things, some are in our power, others are not. In our power are opinion, movement toward a thing, desire, aversion. Not in our power are the body, property, reputation, offices. Now, Epictetus seems to be suggesting here that a division according to which we have more or less complete control of our minds, attitudes, 
and no control whatsoever of our bodies and, and what's external to our, our bodies. He then sort of exerts, exhorts us to be concerned only, within, uh, only with what is within our control, that is our minds and attitudes, and not at all by what's external to them. He says, for instance, this, take away then aversion from all things which are not in our power and transfer it to things contrary to the nature of what's in our power. Um, now, um, Epictetus' contrast is clearly overblown, exaggerated. For instance, it's by no means clear that we have any greater control over our minds than over our bodies. And in neither case is the con control complete, it's, it's far from uh, complete in both cases, as a matter of fact. Still, I think there's a grain of, more than a grain of truth in Epictetus' view. <clears throat> in his days, people were, to a much greater extent, exposed to various kinds of adversities, both natural adversities, like epidemics, famines, extreme weather, and civil or political adversities like wars, the caprice of tyrants, which they could do little to protect themselves against and prevent. The autarctic response to this was to try to blunt one's vulnerability to these sort of adversaries, but the various mental exercises. Of those sort of adversaries, they were concerned with, where, where they, they were especially concerned with the issue facing death, because this is something we all must do, and it's sort of a pretty serious matter. Uh, remember, for instance, Socrates' view that philosophy is all about learning to die, another startling view. Uh, calmly accepting death, even when it was unjustly imposed on you, was hailed as a principal virtue. Consider, for instance, the Stoic philosopher Julius Carnus, about whom we don't know, we know virtually nothing except the courageous way he confronted the death sentence Caligula imposed on him. Uh, when Caligula sentenced him to death, he just said, thank you, my lord. And then when the centurions came to pick him up for his execution, he was playing some board game. And he simply told him, you're my witness that I'm one piece ahead. And then he walked off to his execution and he said he would be, take care to, to, to see if we can observe when the, the soul leaves the body or something. And Seneca says, approvingly, nobody's done philosophy any longer. <laughs> but it would be a misunderstanding to think that the autarctic attitude can only be applied to momentous issues like death. With respect to a lot of things we engage in, we can distinguish between aspects of them which are more in our control than other things. Consider, for instance, the way we pursue our academic work. If we spend more time cultivating our own minds by reading and thinking, we are concentrating on a goal which is to a greater extent within our control than if we spend more time uh, networking in order to get recognition. Getting recognition is dependent on others in a way that con cultivating or enlarging your mind isn't. So the Autarchus, a person who's uh, practicing the autarchy, would concentrate on uh, enlarging his or her mind. Now, the attitude of autarchy has more or less disappeared from the scene, <clears throat> the philosophical scene, as well as the scene of the rest of society. Heterarchy is the dominant attitude today. One explanation of this shift is probably that the phenomenal pro progress of science has boosted our heterarchy control over uh, nature. We are now, thanks to science, much less exposed to epidemics, famines, and, and other natural catastrophes. 
And also, the, and the political order in many parts of the world <coughs> has improved and made wars, uh, <coughs> wanton execution and violent crimes less uh, <coughs> frequent. That's actually something, part of what Peter Singer was alluding to this morning when he talked about Steven Pinker's book, I think. <coughs> <clears throat> Nonetheless, the autarchy hasn't been rendered obsolete. We still remain frighteningly fragile. At every moment of our life, we risk losing more than we can hope to gain. In fact, we risk losing everything, since we can die at any, po any point of time. It's so easy to kill or seriously harm us that it's practically impossible for us to protect ourselves against all such threats. But still, life might seem <coughs> safe enough for the uh, autarchy to have receded into the background. But I think there is a reason to revive this attitude of autarchy today. The extraordinary <coughs> success of science has produced something of a backlash. The explosion of the human population and its growing consumption are leading to a depletion of natural resources like water and oil, a destruction of habitats crucial for biodiversity, the emission of greenhouse, greenhouse gases from fossil fuels, which have empowered the technology that underlies human affluence, risk causing a devastating global climate change. There is, in short, a downside to our ex extensive ex exploitation of nature, which is getting increasingly ominous. Now, science has also increasingly put in our hands means of affecting our own nature, enhancing various properties of ourselves. So let me distinguish between two forms of enhancement, and now I'm getting to the point. Uh, <coughs> uh, there is heterarchic, heterarchic enhancement, which is enhancement of parts of ourselves which are external to our minds. A prime example is, I think, life extension, as proposed, for instance, by the Rasputin of longevity, Aubrey de Grey. People desire to live longer and health, healthier lives, so heterarchy Heterarchy prescribes uh, supplying it. It's easy to see that this could be a dangerous course. If people live longer, they will consume more and their exploitation of the earth will accelerate. Also, the difference in well being between the affluent and the poor of the, the earth is likely to increase. Runaway heterarchic enhancement risks turning people benefiting from it into something like the mythical figure of Gargantua, uh, Im immortalized by Rabelais. And now we come to the point of my having a PowerPoint presentation, namely this <laughs> representation, not by Rabelais, but by Dormier of uh, Gargantua. And I hope you can sort of see what is, is uh, this giant man sort of feeding from uh, <coughs> peasants or ordinary cities or whatever they sort of <coughs> into his mouth. So, uh, I suggest that rather than striving to boost the goodness of our lives by such heterarchic enhancement, we should do so by the other form of enhancement, autarctic enhancement. Enhancement of our mental capacity to derive enjoyment and pleasure from things we already possess. Uh, spiritual or mental exercises recommended by the Stoics, for instance, uh, emphasized, were designed to, to supply an antidote to what is nowadays called hedonic adaptation, which means that you sort of get bored with things that initially brought you pleasure, uh, pleasure when you get, get used to them and so on. What uh, the Stoics <coughs> recommended was that you, uh, <coughs> made, uh, that you regularly make vivid to yourself how vulnerable you are, that you can lose everything you possess, even your life, at any moment. And so this 
is a way of uh, not sort of uh, perking yourself up and, and, and sort of uh, <coughs> realizing the value of the things you have. And there's also a way of bringing to focus what is important in your life if you think this might be my last day and so on. Uh, <coughs> now, so <coughs> I new biological means could provide an assistance in this matter, help us in this sort of art, art, autarchic uh, uh, enhancement. Julius Carnus ended up one piece ahead of most of us. Perhaps that was because he started out ahead of most of us due to advantageous genetic dispositions. Bio and biomedical means could give the rest of us an uh, an equally good start. But we should also keep, keep in mind what I said a while ago, that those things in, in life people value most, according to many questionnaires, such things as love and friendship are not resource consuming. Uh, so the point is that we should try to sort of uh, <coughs> educate ourselves or enhance ourselves so we can lead more satisfying lives without sort of uh, 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 <coughs> increasing your, our consumption. Traditionally, autocare was equated with self-sufficiency, but that's an impossible I idea. Only an almighty God could be self-sufficient. But a traditional, the accompanying ideal of uh, frugality or, or still stands, and less could be made more. And, and that's why the reason for my second picture. You can't talk about autocare without mentioning Diogenes from Sinope, who I, I let represent the, the opposing attitude of, of, of living a life on, on, on sort of mega resources. Now, what I've been talking about when I'm talking about autarchic enhancement is an ethical or moral, moral ideal in the ancient sense in which ethics incorporated the question of how to lead a good life, a life of eudaimonia. In modern terms, it's rather what's often called a prudential ideal. I don't think that's a, a, a very good term, but uh, there isn't any better term. But prudential ideal should be compatible with moral demands such as the demand to leave enough resources for other beings in the present as well as in the future to live equally good life. Autarchic enhancement fits such demands better than heterarchic uh, enhancement. So that's why I'm saying now that when, for instance, biological means are putting greater uh, increasing our power to, to enhance ourselves, we should reflect on what properties of ourselves we should uh, enhance in the first instance. Thank you. Well, well, Voyan said to me you should speak for about 20 minutes, so that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Good <laughs> Julian said after, after the, the, the total is 40 minutes, so we can spend yes. 39 minutes. I can't improvise, I can't improvise. Or not to talk at all and just listen to questions. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm attracted to your talk because it also relates to the concept of virtue that I'll be talking about later, the notion that we might have additional virtues or hark back to an older tradition of virtue discussions in the concept of moral enhancement. But I've always been attracted to uh, Niebuhr's formulation of this problem. Who's? Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. All right. So in his <clears throat> serenity prayer, he says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So that's a slightly different formulation than what you proposed, which is that we should emphasize more changing ourselves to serenely accept the world and, and our own condition, 
as opposed to having the wisdom or the courage to change other things about the world. So I wonder, you know, the, obviously you don't think we should accept everything about the world. There are lots of uh, oppressive conditions that we should strive to, to change. So how do we have, how can we find the phronesis or the wisdom to know which things to change and which not? I mean, uh, as I said, I, I was talking about autarky and heterarchy as sort of prudential ideas. Uh, and I'm assuming that we are facing moral demands as well. Moral demands that could actually mean changing <laughs> things that are external to our minds. Uh, but I was suggesting that we should strive to have sort of prudential ideas, uh, uh, life, uh, ideas affecting our own lives, which uh, sits better with uh, uh, moral, moral ideas than, than sort of certain forms of enhancement. Like, for instance, I, I, mean, I took the example of life, life extension. So I wasn't, I wasn't excluding moral ideals or moral demands. I was just sort of talking about prudential matters in this, uh, <laughs> what we should sort of concentrate from a prudential point of view here. So, so uh, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. I was, uh, I was just going to repeat myself. <laughs> so the, the, the line of questions we have so far is uh, Rob Sparrow and the lady here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. And then Tom Douglas and anyone else if you want to join the line. Owen and then the lady in front. Yep. So to uh, Rob. Uh, it's kind of curious to hear someone mobilise stoic ideas in an argument for enhancement because so far in the debate they're usually used. You know, by a conservative argument, what's wrong with enhancement is it will induce this endless desire for more, and in some sense, uh, that's uh, self-defeating. So, I mean, it's interesting to hear you sort of yeah. give an argument that's traditionally hostile to enhancement. Uh, well. Uh, or, I'm not interested in statistics, <laughs> so my view is sort of uh, unusual. But okay, but I, guess I, I do worry that there's a sort of practical contradiction involved in the claim that in order to have more control over my own circumstances, I need some drugs, you know, or I need access to medical uh, technology. It seems to me the truth that that's relying on biomedical technologies to achieve a certain sort of calm or spiritual well-being is precisely the sort of reliance on external circumstances that this is proposed to. It, it could be. Uh, I mean, I wasn't sort of in this talk recommended biomedical means specifically. Uh, I was rather saying that um, when we have the traditional means, perhaps we can develop those further. But now the uh, new possibilities open up, which we should, uh, which we should explore. I think. But it, you may be right that if we try out those means, we find uh, they will be uh, uh, conflict with the autarctic ideal of independence, because we would be dependent on, on some drugs or something. I guess we can see that now, that if, if, if someone says, what should I do to become happier in myself or happier with the like, control I have over my life, you need pill X. Yeah, well, uh, but, but I mean, it, it, it's, as I said, we can't ever be self-sufficient. We would be dependent on, on, on something, one thing or another. Uh, and it may be <laughs> some sort of drugs or whatever could could sort of increase your <laughs> overall independence. Or okay, I think you were next. Okay, uh, I'll put you in the line. Uh, so I think the next one was Tom Douglas. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I, I guess I was thinking this, this sense of autarky. Uh, I mean, so the mind is not very close to the self and one's sense of identity. Yeah, I mean, much more so than <laughs> external factors. And I guess when we're reflecting on that, it makes me wonder whether, whether we should really prefer these autark autarkic enhancements. So I, I can imagine if we're doing this from, from a prudential perspective. So we can imagine some, you know, uh, some benefit you can get, uh, some prudential benefit. 
And you can get it, let's say, either through autarkic or hetero, uh, heterarchic uh, uh, means or uh, enhancements, right? And which which would we prefer as the means? And I, I guess you point out there's, there's <laughs> some advantages for the autarkic. I mean, that would be, that would be, for instance, uh, a certain level of satisfaction, yeah, sure, or something. Some, some level of satisfaction. And two different methods. You're trying to decide which one you can you can will lead to this. And let's assume that they're equally likely to lead to this level of satisfaction. It strikes me that there's some significant reason to prefer the heterarchic. Uh, enhancement, because the autarkic enhancement is going to muck around with your identity and your sense of self. It's going to bring you further away from who you were. And presumably, you have certain values and uh, so what? Concept. I don't think identity matters. I think it matters to become a better person. If it, you become a better person by coming, becoming less sort of. Uh, less what you're like in, in the past. I mean, so what? Well, the idea is uh, we're, we're fixing like the, the two examples becoming equally better with either strategy. So assuming you can use the external means or the internal means to become a better person. And it's just a question about, so given that you're going to become a better person either way, mm -hmm. what is the better way to go about it? And I understand you might think that would just, you know, maybe, maybe empirically it's more likely to get this improvement through autarky. But in the case where you get the same level of improvement from both. Maybe you don't find any value at all to who you are and, and maintaining, you know, sort of I mean, I, I, to some extent I don't I don't see what you're talking about. You're talking about becoming a better person. Yeah. You you're talking about <laughs> changing your state of mind, your mental attitude your attitudes, your mindset or whatever. But that would be per definition an autarchic uh, um, goal, so to speak. Well, you know, Rather than sort of the hot uh, rhetoric would be to sort of change things so they fit your state of mind. So I guess you're saying that you, it's impossible to get the same benefits out of, uh, out of these two. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah yes, you can get the same benefit, but you don't change the sort of person you, uh, you are. You get uh, you, you, the amount of satisfaction might be the same irrespective of whether you change your desires to fit the world or change the world to fit your desires. Yeah. It could, in theory, they could be. Sure, sure. And so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that kind of the thing we're trying to get is, is, the, is, 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 this, is this benefit. So you're, you're saying that there's something good about changing yourself, about, about, about making your, about altering no, your, no. your desires. No, no, no. It, it's not in, <laughs> It's not good in your in itself to ch you change yourself. So, uh, the point is that by changing yourself, by changing your attitudes, and so on, you can derive more satisfaction from the same resources. So it's, it's sort of it's so to speak more economic, and that's pretty important. And also, uh, you might be sort of attracted to a certain, uh, uh, certain form of independence. I mean, I'm, I, I confess, and I mean, people were pretty autobiographical this morning, so I, mean, I, I could be a bit autobiographical as well. So I'm, I'm attracted to independence. It doesn't just collapse into a kind of solipsism where you know, the ultimate is being happy with yourself rather than dependent on other people around you for your happiness. Well, well as, I said, I, as I said, I don't, I don't think that is, that is a possible uh, uh, or, or, or desirable. Um, uh, <coughs> I mean, for instance, somebody like uh, Diogenes, he, he suddenly... Uh, he was certainly striving towards that sort of independence of, of social relationships and so on, but I don't think you necessarily you, you have to go down that particular path. <laughs> you were next. Uh, first, I, I welcome the idea of Andalkeia here in, as part of human enhancement debate, and uh, the similar approach can be found in. Um, the guy is Russian Christian philosopher. Ah, yes, yes, I yeah. know him not much, but. Yeah. Okay, he's, he's foreseen yeah. of new Middle Ages as a return to spirituality and uh, individual approach. It's, it's, it's a similar to this, but uh, this is not my question, of course. Um, uh, what was I interested in was um, this uh, approach to human nature, 
Uh, that, uh, that you assumed by this uh, hetrarchy and our... Yes, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay, yes, Heter hetrarchy, I, I would say, but I'm not... I'm not uh, it could be after K, yeah, yeah, I don't know if the other one. means something else. So, yes, yes, I understand, yeah. okay. So, um, uh, it, uh, it depends two correctly, it would be a dualistic approach to human nature. So my question would be... It, it would be what sort of... A dualistic approach to human nature. Uh, on one side you have mind, and on the other side you have some kind of outer enhancement, for example... Yes, otherwise I would be a solipsist, like yeah, <laughs> Julian exactly. said. Right? <laughs> uh, but if we, for example, take another kind of approach to human nature, which we, which we can uh, find uh, in understanding of man as a defective being, in Anaxagora, Herder, Dan Gelen, even Thomas Aquinas and Kant, which means that man's defectiveness mm. towards animal, defectiveness in the lack of instincts, is connected with his uh, development of culture, world, world, and his mind and in, in intellectual capacities. Um, how would you compare this kind of understanding of human nature, in which mind and body are connected, with this dualistic approach, in which one doesn't necessarily mean uh, enhancing the other? To understand. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but but uh, I mean, for instance, the Stoics they, they they suddenly thought that by nature we we're sort of pretty imperfect. That's why we need Stoic the, the training they were so offering. Uh, yes, compared to animals, we were we were uh, superior because we had in ourselves this lo logos or yeah, but possibility. Uh, uh, but but I, I don't see how dualism enters into it. The only assumption I I'm making is is a sort of non-solipsistic uh, <laughs> assumption, namely that um, uh, apart from my mind, and that that's that's an external world. And we, we also uh, constituted that we have desires with respect to the external world. Uh, uh, and so I, uh, what I was saying, what, that sort of two ways of, of, of producing an equilibrium or, or, or satisfaction of those desires, either sort of changing the external world or changing the desires. So in both pictures there would be sort of an assumption that our minds and something else, which is the object of desire. So, Michael. Sure. So, question of clarification. I hear from your talk a representation of certain moral ideal like Jogeneth. I mean, I can hear the argument for diversity in moral styles, but where exactly the enhancement comes, which is in? become better at deriving satisfaction from the things you have, whatever it is. I mean, that's, that's a form of enhancement or improvement and so on. And life extension, <laughs> leading a longer and healthier life, that would be another form of enhancement. So I don't see why you, don't, why you can't say there's any enhancement in one here. No, just terminology. I mean, you would say that any fulfillment of a moral ideal would be an enhancement. No, no, terminology. no, 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 uh, no, uh, no. I mean, I, uh, <coughs> I wasn't talking. I mean, life extension isn't the fulfillment of a moral ideal. It's just it's something we desire. We desire to live longer and healthier life. If there's improvement in that respect, that's a form of enhancing ourselves. If we enhance our capacity to live longer and healthier lives. Tom? Yeah, so I just wanted to see what you thought about a case. So, because um, it seems to me that 
I was quite persuaded that often the best solutions to certain problems credentially would be kind of autarchic solutions, but so would often the worst solutions would also be autarchic. So <laughs> yeah, you might be right. So, uh, so suppose, um, suppose I've got a problem which is that everyone is uh, racist against New Zealanders and this is like causing lots of problems for me and, and one solution is to try to stop people being racist, so that's a heterotic solution. Another solution is to kind of stop caring what other people think or something like that. And another, and a third solution is uh, to to accept all the racist beliefs of other people and come to come to accept that yeah, New Zealanders are a barrier, and uh, and that might also kind of make me happier. And it seems like maybe stopping caring about what other people think is the best solution, but uh, accepting kind of views of others, racist views of others, is the worst solution. Um, yeah, from from a moral point of view. Well, even from a financial point of view, yeah. you could argue that. Uh, well, I, I wanted to know what, what you, whether you think that uh, even the accepting the racist views of others is the kind of auto, autarchic solution that we uh, would have prudential reasons to, uh, to accept. I, I, I mean, it, it might, it may be there might be something bad about sort of uh, learning to accept racist. <laughs> uh, ideas from a even from a prudential point of view, because I mean, if you s stop caring about it, you won't do anything about it, and you do have a, a sort of moral obligation to. So, so uh, extrinsically, you can have reasons to uh, sort of keep up this. Um, I think this is a, a bit like um, this is um, a certain attitude. To anger, which uh, uh, the, the, the Stoics and, and many people who practice martial arts have. I mean, you should feign the attitude of anger, but you shouldn't actually be ang angry. You should just sort of. I mean, sometimes you 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 need to put on the show of anger because that's that's a language people understand. They won't understand anything else, but you shouldn't really feel anger. <laughs> That's sort of. <laughs> so, so, so the solution here would be to uh, accept the racist views of others, but you know, no, no, well, not accept it in in the sense that you think they are right, but but not be upset, but but uh, fight against them. All, so. Yeah.
you would become, you realize you would be in it, so you would like care, you would be unhappy and so on. I think that the world is in a decline. So I don't think you, you rationally constrain to be a maximizer of, of the way that you put a bridge. I think you could be, but I don't think it's exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't think you need to be. So my, my reply to your question would be, yes, I think enjoyment and so on are important uh, for the value of your life. But I don't think you have to at all. Well, that's um, 40 minutes, so I think you should cut yourself off at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be happy with that. <laughs> so thank you, everyone.